Welcome, welcome everyone to the Best Damn Podcast. I'm your host, John Keen. As always, I'd like to thank you guys for joining me. Ask that you please add, follow, and check us out. www.thebestdampodcast.tv Follow me. Instagram, Facebook, Best Damn Podcast, Twitter, The Real Best Damn, and wherever you're watching from, make sure to hit the like, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, let me know what you think, and share this link. Get it out there. Also, make sure to subscribe. Click the bell to get all the notifications. Check out the other content on the channel, tarot, astrology, so much more. Um, and keep in mind, guys, we're completely viewer power. That means we're fully funded and supported by you, the viewer. So if you'd like to donate support to the channel, you can do it by going to Facebook or YouTube subscriptions, PayPal, Venmo, Patreon, Cash App, or Facebook Messenger Pay. You can also book your own personal tarot reading. Uh, the information, the links, and the phone numbers in the description box down below, or join the Best Damn Fam. Thirty-three bucks a month get access to our private, live, and exclusive content. Today we have got quite the treat. Um, you know, back by popular demand, we are doing the old format of videos along with all of the astrology readings and astrology videos and the tarot readings and tarot videos. Um, I decided to bring back the old format and to do these deep spiritual dives. Um, really kind of digging down and getting to the depths of the occult, of the mysteries and, you know, illumination in itself. And I feel like these esoteric videos are really going to open people up. And it's going to make the tarot and astrology videos that much richer if you have the base knowledge to kind of go along, you know, with all this stuff. So today we're going to be looking at the gods of Egypt, the mysteries of Egypt. Uh, we'll be getting a little bit into Rosicrucianism, uh, the OTO, uh, the Golden Dawn as well. You know, obviously it's uh, directly connected to the Egyptian gods, the Egyptian mysteries. We're going to look at the all-seeing eye and illumination, right, enlightenment. Uh, you know, and this is coming off the back of last week, which we're going to be doing one of these every single week now, um, where we ask the question, you know, is it a new age spiritual movement? Is this happening naturally, right? The collective conscious just kind of growing, expanding, this natural awakening and enlightenment that's taking place, or... Are we seeing the masses kind of being programmed? You know, is this part of the fucking matrix system, right? The illusion. Um, and we're seeing people being mass indoctrinated into Rosicrucianism, Hermeticism, right? The mysteries, which is in essence Luciferianism, okay? And it's all part of this design to take us into a one world system, a one world order, right? And, um, you know, that gets into some whole other shit, but you guys... You, you basically know, and if you haven't checked out last week's video, make sure to watch that. It's called um, Doctrine of Devils, I believe is the name of it. So, um, Also, make sure to check out your, your sun, moon, rise, uh, rising readings, you know, tarot readings, and check out the astrology videos to get some more insight on the energies that are taking place. So let's start here first with the Egyptian gods and goddesses. Uh, humans and semi-human forms of some of the chief Egyptian deities. And we have 12 of them, which anytime uh, we see that number 12, automatically it makes me think of the zodiacal wheel, right? The zodiac, the calendar, okay? The 12, uh, if you will, disciples, right? Like, of oh, Christ as well, okay? These are the archetypes of man. There's both a positive and negative, right? Masculine and feminine. So we'll kind of go look at this, right? And starting with uh, Horus, right? The son of Osiris, or the son of God, right? A sky god closely connected with the king. And anytime we see the sky god, you guys will think of gods like Jupiter, Thor, uh, Zeus, right? Jupiter meaning Joe Gibbon, Jehovah, right? The, 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 the king planet as well, Christ. Um, Set, the enemy of Osiris, and Set, uh, the temple of Set, Satan, um, a lot of people connect to Set with Satan, the god of storm and disorder. Number three, Toth or Thought. This is a moon deity and the god of writing, counting, and wisdom. And when we think of Toth, um, the moon god, 
you know, Luna or Lucifer is a lot of times connected with the moon as well. Um, and, you know, Inky, God of writing, you know, wisdom. Uh, we also have Kanum, a ram god who shapes men and their cause on his potter's wheel. And this will, you know, take you to Ares, right? Uh, or Marduk, the ram, okay? Uh, Hathor, the goddess of love, birth, and death. And a lot of these will be archetypes of the same, you know, one or two deities as well. Um, but the goddess of love, birth, and death, Sobek, the crocodile god, the lord of the Fayum, Ra, the sun god, in his many forms, Amun, which is the creator god, which is linked with Ra, that's where we get Amen Ra, or Amen, and Ptah, another creator god, and the patron of craftsmen, a lot of times also uh, associated with Inky. Inky's uh, heavily associated with Lucifer as well. Uh, Hermes, right? Uh, Anubis, the god of mummification. You know, this is the dog-headed god, once again, connected with the moon. Like wolves, dogs, howling at the moon, connected with Lucifer, the lord of the underworld. Pluto, Mercury, uh, Venus, the god of love. Right, Osiris, the god of death, one soul infinitely resurrecting in spirit, and eleven is Osiris, the god of agriculture and the ruler of the dead, and finally his wife, Isis, or the wife of Isis, the mother of Horus, and the mistress of magic. Uh, you know, often associated with the divine feminine. It says, when you study the mythologies of ancient civilizations, you realize that they are all designed by the same geometric blueprint that follows into humanity's current timeline. And this is what I'm talking about. Um, you know, we see the 12, right, representing the zodiacal wheel, which is the heavens, right? The celestial spheres, this is, um, you know, the astrological signs of the zodiac. Uh, pertaining to the procession of the equinox, right? Um, as well as, you know, astrology and how it correlates to our daily lives. And this goes back to the watchers, the messengers, the fallen, the Nephilim, uh, which are the planets, right? The planets, which uh, connect to the days of the week and everything. And that's why you see this deity worship, right? Um, and it's all these celestial beings, these heavenly hosts, which are the stars, Right, so the same geometric blueprint we see it all across all of the religions of the world. We further find the pattern of creation and destruction, right? Always the god of creation of life and the god of destruction and death. Okay, um, we further find the pattern of creation and destruction repeating in the cycles of time. Everything is cyclical, it's on an orbit, a cycle. Embracing the human experience. Uh, designing the gods and goddesses falls into the same categories of duality. Good and bad, light and dark. We can also take that to masculine and feminine, solar and lunar, right? Red and blue. It goes on and on and on. Forever seeking balance and the return to full consciousness, right? As we have found ourselves in the illusion of separation, which is that image or reflection we call our shadow side, our masculine side. Now, always we find gods who came from the sky, which is higher frequency or higher dimensional space, higher levels of consciousness, and those that come from the sea of creation. And think about the Bible talking about the separation of the waters above and below the firmament, the sea. Sea translates into sea foam, which is also semen or urine or piss. Right? Really weird, I know. But this is the collective unconsciousness. And remember, Christ walked on water. Um, and in the age of Aquarius, it's a man carrying a pail of water. Their creation myths speak to us about a beginning and an end for earth. Giving rise to something greater. And this is like, you know, the new age, right? The millennial reign. The, the fucking end is Judgment Day, Ragnarok. Like it's many religions kind of talk about this age, right, and this time, you know, where it's kind of expected that, you know, uh, or apotheosis, like we talked about in the video last week, where um, mankind will reach God-like status, kind of be deified themselves, you know, return back to Godhood, back to the place they fell from, back to the garden, restored back in unison um, with the creator, the source, God, or, you know, back to our older heavenly estate, if we were, in fact, fallen angels. Um, 
We are reaching the end of the current programmed experience. It says, our creation must speak to us about a beginning and end for Earth, giving rise to something greater. We are reaching the end of the current programmed experience. Reality is a holographic projection seen through the eye of consciousness in time. And we're going to talk about, you know, the simulated reality and stuff like that here in just a minute. We're also going to talk about the eye as well. Now, the eye, which is your third eye, uh, Kundalini awakening, serpent energy, right? Illumination, enlightenment. Uh, the eye is metaphor for the place of creation through which all things emerge as consciousness and are experienced in archives as it moves to the next, right? The Akashic record is within that as well, which is the binary code of information, energetic holographic information uh, within the dimensional space of reality, right? And we're all receiving, sending and receiving signals, uh, frequency signals based on the elevated state of consciousness we're at that we're vibrating at. Are we able to receive that frequency or giving off that frequency? And we're all connected collectively with this, you know, fine silver, silver lining that connects all of us yet we're individuals as we have our own little soul which is a unique expression a unique mask that is placed on the energy that animates everything which is the creator which is spirit which is consciousness now the egyptian pantheons of major gods and minor gods and goddesses follow the patterns along with animal representations that link to destruction and rebirth, birds, cats, aquatic beings who create or destroy. And think about that, you know, um, the different elements, earth, uh, wind, water, fire, right? And these different um, animals representing deistic spirits as well. Um, you know, and in truth, and it also talks about this hero journey or this, you know, process of death and rebirth, you know, as part of the reincarnation cycle. In truth, one soul played the roles of all the gods. That soul also played the god roles in all of the ancient civilizations as told in their creation myths. Who they are and what they symbolize are all part of the myth, the math, the metaphor, and the magic of realities. How about that? And part of the myth, the math, and the magic of the realities. You know, essentially saying that one soul infinitely resurrecting in spirit so let's take a look here we're going to look at the holographic universe as well as the eye so first we start with the holographic universe and simulation theory and this is just kind of going to give you um, a base understanding on how things are to be looked at or the way things are being looked at from kind of a quantum standpoint now, reality as a simulation or hologram is no longer a fringe theory. With Nobel Prize winners and other thought leaders believing in it, all scientific discoveries start out as theories. Some ultimately proven, some not. There is still the question of whether our universe actually exists. We may be simply living in something's virtual reality simulation. Very hard to prove one way or the other, but we are getting closer. And if you think about the Kabbalion and Hermeticism, it basically says the all is mind, right? The universe is mind. The universe is mental, saying we live in some God's dream. The theory that reality, as we consciously experience it, is not real, uh, goes back to the indigenous people who believe that we exist in a dream or an illusion. And if we look at Genesis in the Bible, when it talks about um, the humans, humankind, mankind was made in the image of the Elohim, right? Uh, image, if you break that down, it means a phantom, a projection, an illusion, a specter, right? It's a shadow. It's a reflection. It is a distorted reflection, right? So... The shadow that we're seeing is actually us. So if you think about it, um, we are in the heavens. The light is being consciously projected downward through um, the lens or the prism of the, the firmament, which is our magnetic field, right? And kind of coming through in hologram form 
uh, or as a projection of frequency, sound, and light, right, down here, you know, and it's called soul luminescence, star in a jar, we've talked about it on this channel before, how it all works, right, and why it works the way it does, and it's like the heavenly host looking down into creation, the planets being closer, right, having, uh, that's why are, they are the, the governors or the rulers of this reality, uh, and have a more direct and bigger influence on the earth and the people as well. That's why they would be like the main gods, you know, or the pantheon of gods in every uh, religion that we see since the beginning of time. So we may be simply living in something's virtual reality simulation, very hard to prove one way or the other, but we're getting closer. The theory that reality, as we consciously experience it, is not real, it goes back to the indigenous people who believe that we exist in a dream or illusion. In our current timeline, we refer to our virtual reality experience as a matrix, grids, simulation, and hologram. There are those trying to prove the simulation exists and others who are trying to break us out of it. Time is an illusion, therefore so is everything else. The universe is a consciousness hologram or simulation. Reality is projected illusion within. And it is a virtual experiment created in linear time to study emotions. Our simulation is composed of grids created by source consciousness brought into awareness by electromagnetic energy at the physical level. And this would be the ley lines or the earth grid, right? Um, kind of providing the toroidal, the base for this toroidal field, right? Um, that, that we all call the 33rd parallel and all of this having these energetic frequencies across the globe you know and we see this um you know the magnetic anomalies on the poles and all of this and uh the migration of the poles showing shifts in consciousness when these things happen you know and we see that our reality is cyclical if you just look at the, the geologic data the soil records you know every looks like every three four hundred years you know there is a, a turnover something happens there's been many um, cataclysms and destructions on the earth and is this part of something that is in an orbit you know like a comet that goes by kind of like clockwork um, you know a recurring micronova some type of flare with the Sun blowing massive amounts of energy or expulsions of energy whatever it is the Sun is connected to human consciousness in our spirituality, our brain frequency, brain activity, you know, and we are connected to the earth, and that's why the Schumann resonance is, in essence, a human resonance, kind of, you know, showing our current, you know, uh, conscious frequency at the time, based on the spikes and peaks, which is directly connected to space weather, solar weather, and all of that, so it's like, we are connected to the stars. The stars have a direct effect on us. Space has a direct effect on us. As a matter of fact, radiation mutates DNA. And we see every time that there is a destruction, a cataclysm, a catastrophic ending to a cycle, things mutate and they change and they alter. That's why we have all these periods, Cretaceous, Cambrian, Jurassic, Triassic, right? All these periods. Um, you know, and we see massive changes across the planet, just as recent as a younger Dryas, you know? So it's like... Things mutate, things evolve, things change, and there's these mass die-offs, these, um, you know, massive shifts. And I believe that they're connected with consciousness as well. That's why we have such, you know, this amnesia. As the magnetic field drops, which, you know, outer space being the outer psyche, you look at the Bible, and in Hebrew, the, the north, or the hidden, means the deep. It's space, it's the hidden, the deep, right? It's outside of the collective consciousness, or outside of the firmament, the psyche, the magnetic field, right? Um, and it's like outside of that is kind of like, uh, you know, it's disconnected from our shared experience within here. Everything's being projected from the sun, reflected off of the planets and the stars, projecting energy down to us. We're receiving those signals, right? Um, and we have these beautiful computers we call brains that are able to kind of put the, you know, the body and the spirit together within the mind, you know, and we're these triune beings here having this experience but we are in essence we're awareness and consciousness experience in itself we're fragments of god the creator experiencing itself it's crazy right and it's like is this all a projection you know and is each reality different we see that there's a disconnection from the optical nerve to the brain meaning that we create or we make up in essence through our brains what we're even seeing you know so it's like we have we see 0.00001 percent of the electromagnetic light spectrum so there's so much we don't see 
right? And it's because we have these blinders, these governors on our brain don't allow us to access more than 10% at any time. It's like, is this designed to kind of let us forget that we're eternal? That way we can have this physical experience of life. You know, are we the angels? Are we the God? You know, how, how does it all happen? You know, and are we playing along in some type of, you know, simulation or illusion? Uh, or dream in some god's mind. You know, even people like Elon Musk say the probability is way higher that it's a simulation than anything else. Um, time is an illusion, therefore so is everything else. The consciousness is a hologram or simulation. Reality is projected illusion within. It's a virtual experiment created in linear time to study emotions. Simulation is composed of grids created by source consciousness brought into awareness by electromagnetic energy at a physical level. The hologram is created and linked through a web or grid matrices, and we have a worldwide web too, right? So we're creating an artificial grid within the, the, the natural grid that's already existing, which is a, a copy of, the, of the, he, the spiritual grid in the heavens. So, you know, we have the um, quantum field, which is like spirit, right? And the projection or the copy of that is the physical, and the copy of that is the artificial. So it's like, you know, threefold reality right here with these different matrices. So we're existing in multiple paradigms and dimensions at, at one time, probably. We're timeless. Um, in media, we find films, television shows, and games based on the concept of reality or simulation, the matrix. Uh, increased understanding of AI will bring clarity to the concept of reality or simulation as it's virtually connected. And remember, AI, the archons, technology, demons, divics, right? All they are doing, essentially, they are masks, right? They are masks that we put on consciousness and they are um, copies, right, of what's already created. It's mimicry of what's already created. So AI is just a mimicry of a, a system already in place. Um, simulated reality is a hypothesis that reality, reality could be simulated, for example, by computer simulation to a degree indistinguishable from true reality. It could contain conscious minds, which may or may not be fully aware that they're living inside a simulation. And we can already see that you know, AI is able to data mine and copy consciousness now. Um, and the World Wide Web can connect you in. Uh, you know, to these neural networks and quantum computers, which have, they're sentient, they're self-aware, they have fucking heartbeats and D-wave. Um, you know, and the D or delta wave is the sleep wave, right? And the, the dream world is the astral world, right? Where we have the astral cord, which connects us consciously, and we take off the physical. Um, this is quite different from the current technologically achievable concept of virtual reality. Virtual reality is easily distinguished from the experience of actuality. Participants are never in doubt about the nature of what they experience. Simulated reality, by contrast, would be hard or impossible to separate from the true reality. In a virtual reality, it's just like you could supplant the senses and create a reality just the same as virtual reality. It's just, um, you know, we're seeing optical frequencies, um, that are being picked up by our eyes. Our eyes are actually seeing a reflection of the heavens above. And we know in the Nag Hammadi it talks about um, the earth being a reflection of the heavens above um, uh, because our, our eyes take images and they flip them upside down once they hit the back of our eyes. So we're seeing everything upside down, inverted, like a, you know looking into a puddle. You know, the water's above and below the firmament. It's a reflection of the image. Um, you know, so we're, we're already seeing like a mirrored uh, reality and we're picking up, you know, the optical uh, frequencies through our eyes. The signals are sent to our brain. We hear the vibrations. It, it have, comes a sound. Signals sent to our brain. So, you know, we could put anything into our senses and create a new reality in essence, right? It wouldn't be that hard. It's not, you know, it's not unfathomable to even think, right? Reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one, you know? And it really is, okay? It really is. Now, moving forward, we're going to take a look here. Consciousness. We exist in a matrix simu simulation, hologram, or virtually programmed reality that we believe is real because our brains tell us it is. Consciousness is all, and everything is the virtual simulation of our experiences brought into awareness by the brain. An electrochemical machine forever viewing streaming codes for experience and interpretation, which is, you know, season binary code in essence. 
the human biogenetic experiment is consciousness brought forth into the physical by the patterns of sacred geometry that repeats in cycles called time. It's all binary code, ones and zeros. Creating patterns for the matrix of our brain can interpret as real and having meaning. And I mean, if you think about it, you know, that's in essence what it is, where the energetic frequencies are coming as, you know, data, information, right? Binary code for our brains to interpret, and we interpret those as signals uh, as reality. Um, consciousness may involve thoughts, sensations, perceptions, moods, emotions, dreams, and self-awareness. It is variously seen as a type of mental state, a way of perceiving a relationship between self and other. It's been described as a point of view, an I, or what Thomas Nagel called the existence of something that it is like to be something. Many philosophers have seen consciousness as the most important thing in the universe. On the other hand, many scientists have seen the word as too nebulous in meaning to be useful. Consciousness is the subject of the much research in the philosophy of mind, psychology, neuroscience, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence. Issues of practical concern include how the presence of consciousness can be assessed in severely ill or comatose. <laughs> um, it's a term that refers to the relationship between the mind and the world in which it interacts. Now, let's take a look here. We've got the definition of consciousness. We're going to go here to the eye. The eye symbology. Uh, the word eye has many, many meanings from an organ that detects light to the symbolic eye with its many metaphors that link to conscious awareness. Reality is a consciousness simulation virtually experienced through the eye of time. The physical eye has a pupil symbolizing we are pupils or students in a university or universe. And remember, Christ in the Gospel of Thomas has said, if uh, thine eye be single, then thy whole body be filled with light. The eye symbolizes the center of the Milky Way galaxy or black hole, which it takes us to the simulation theory. The vesica Pisces, or the vertical pupils of the eye, the flower of life. Eyes have rods and cones, 12 around one. The Egyptian mystery school teachings, the eye of Horus and Isis, eye is, is, is to exist. The all-seeing eye, the great seal of the United States. The attached capstone represents consciousness through the eye and the eye and the triangle has been associated with the eye of God and the Illuminati. Um, the pseudoscience on this, and notice they call it pseudoscience, the reality grids, we are, use the eye to see water, the flow of the collective unconsciousness, grids, or matrices, or experiences of time. Dreams and meditations of the eye. To see an eye that is open means one is awakening to higher frequency or consciousness. Closed means metaphorically one is still asleep. The, uh, the window to the soul. To understand that the eye is a window to the soul, there are two techniques you can use alone or with others. Alone, stand in front of a mirror in the dark. Shine a flashlight below your face pointing upward. Now stare at the eye in the mirror and you shall see your image change into many people. Some may not be human, all of whom are aspects of your soul experiencing in other grids. And I've never heard that before, so that's interesting. Um, two people sit across from the person, dimly lit, dark room, place the flashlight below your face again, and this will enable the other person to see in your other lives and tell you what they see as they look through the window of your soul. They may see themselves in the lifetime with you. Next, repeat this by looking into the other person's eyes. And it's important to not to move while doing this form of scrying. To truly be skilled at this, you will take the other person or yourself to their soul spark of light. It is the flicker of light the white, blue, or purple that you sometimes see in the periphery of your field of vision for only a second. Always remember, your experience is here is just that, a second. And the chakras, the third eye chakra, or the pineal gland, looks into the higher frequency or clairvoyance. The eclipse of consciousness and alchemy of time. So, here's your eye symbolism. takes us to the all-seeing eye. 
Throughout history, you find the iconic symbols that repeat in most civilizations, such as the spiral, movement of consciousness above and below, and the eye linked to the black hole in simulation theory, or Masonic programs, and more. The center of the eye is a pupil, signifying humans or students are part of a bioengenetic experiment to study emotions in the university or the universe. The eye of providence, or the all-seeing eye of God, is a symbol showing an eye often surrounded by rays of light or a glory and usually enclosed by a triangle. It is sometimes interpreted as representing the eye of God watching over humankind or divine providence. In the modern era, the most notable depiction of the eye is the reverse of the great seal of the United States, which appears on the United States $1 bill. And you can see it right there. In 1782, the Eye of Providence was adopted as part of the symbolism of the re reverse side of the Great Seal of the U.S. It was first suggested as an element of the Great Seal by the first of three design committees in 1776 and is thought to be the suggestion of the artistic consultant Pierre Eugene de Cimetier. On the seal, the eye is surrounded by the words Anuit Coeptus, meaning he approves or has approved our undertakings and novus ordo seclorum, meaning new order of the ages or new world order. The eye is positioned above an unfinished pyramid with 13 steps, representing the original 13 states and the future growth of the country. Uh, 13 is also the aeon that Pistis Sophia fell from, right, in the Gnostic um, beliefs. So I'm just saying that as well. Um, it's uh, considered an unlucky number too, right? Friday the 13th, you know, uh, Jacques Villeneuve and um, the Knights Templars and all of that. So uh, the lowest level of the pyramid shows the year 1776 in Roman numerals. The combined implication is that the eye or God favors the prosperity of the United States. Perhaps due to its use in the design of the Great Seal, the eye has made its way into other American seals and logos, notably the Seal of Colorado and, you guessed it, DARPA's Information Awareness Office. And DARPA and the DOD has essentially done, you know, everything from chemtrails to jabs to, you know, 5G to you name it, okay? Um, in the modern era, the most notable depiction of the eye is the reverse of the Great Seal of the U.S., which appears on the $1 bill. The Freemasons, the all-seeing eye is a symbol of Freemasonry, representing the great architect of the universe, and Lucifer being that architect. The eye first appeared as part of the standard iconography of the Freemasons in 1797 with the publication of Thomas Smith Webb's Freemasons Monitor. Here... It represents the all-seeing eye of God and is a reminder that a Mason's thoughts and deeds are always observed by God, who is referred to in Masonry as the great architect of the universe. Typically, the Masonic eye of providence has a semicircular glory below the eye. Sometimes the eye is enclosed by a triangle. And this would also be the Eye of Ra as well. Popular among conspiracy theorists is that the claim of the Eye of Providence shown atop an unfinished pyramid of the Great Seal of the U.S. indicates the influence of Freemasonry in the founding of the U.S. This was dramatized in the 2004 film National Treasure. However, common Masonic uses of the Eye dates 14 years after the creation of the Great Seal and the Masonic version does not incorporate a pyramid, although the enclosing triangle is often interpreted as one. Furthermore, among three members of the original design committee for the Great Seal, or any of the ones that followed it, only Benjamin Franklin was a Mason, and his ideal for the Seal were not adopted. Indeed, um, many Masonic organizations have explicitly denied any connection to the creation of the Seal, and um, Benjamin Franklin was also a member of the Hellfire Club as well, so just throwing that out there. Um, we're not going to look at the crop circles. We are going to take a look at Egypt, though. The image of the all-seeing eye can be traced to the Egyptian mythology and the eye of Horus. Right? Eye of Horus. In the Great Pyramid. Buddhism. The eye symbology also appears in Buddhism, where Buddha is also regularly referred to as the eye of the world. Throughout the Buddhist scriptures, uh, the Mahabana Sutta, 
which is represented as a trinity in the shape of a triangle known as Tiratna, or the Triple Gem. Mexico. The Mexican Ojo de Venado charm is an ancient shamanic amulet made from a psychedelic legume seed, and it is given an eye-related name, Ojo de Venado meaning deer eye. Other references uh, in the medieval and renaissance European iconography, the eye, with, often with the addition of an enclosing triangle, was an explicit image of the Christian trinity. That's right. Christian trinity. 17th century depictions of the eye of providence sometimes show it surrounded by clouds or sunbursts in regions where the evil eye belief occurs. The all-seeing eye is one of the many forms of the reflective eye charm used as the apotropaic talisman against this danger. In its specifically protective role, the all-seeing eye appears on at least one North American good luck coin to guard the bearer from evil. And alchemy. Alchemy. Quomodo doom. An alchemical woodcut showing the all-seeing eye of God floating in the sky, often thought of as a UFO. And this also connects with enemies thought to be the Watchers, right? Remember, Saturn has the um, hexagon on its north pole, right? Which, the six, the hex, right? The X. Uh, and the all-seeing eye on the South Pole, and we also know on Jupiter it has the great red eye, right? The storm on Jupiter as well. So, just putting that out there, you know, we know both of the, the, the main planets there uh, have that, you know. So, just kind of something to consider. Now, we're going to take a look at some of the different... Um, schools of thought here pertaining to Egypt and uh, different mythologies. So first we'll start here with the Jed. The Jed, right, or the Jedi. This is a symbol of one or more of the ancient and commonly found symbols in Egyptian mythology. It's a pillar-like symbol in the hieroglyphs representing stability. Think about the pillars, right, in Heliopolis. Um, Hercules pillars, right? It's associated with Osiris. The Egyptian god of the afterlife, the underworld, and the dead. It's commonly understood uh, to represent his spine. And um, not just the spine is represented, but it's also like a rod um, or a wand or a staff um, for, you know, wisdom with Hermes and, you know, um, or kingship, you know, Jupiter, right? Um, the pillars, like I said, the solar and lunar pillars, Heliopolis. So, you know, many different in the spine for the Kundalini, right? Um, in the myth of Osiris and Isis, Osiris was killed by Set by being tricked into a coffin made to fit Osiris exactly. Set then had the coffin with the now deceased Osiris flung into the Nile. The coffin was carried by the Nile to the ocean and onto the city of Byblos in Syria. It ran around a sacred tree root and rapidly grew around the coffin, enclosing the coffin within its trunk. The king of the land, intrigued by the tree's quick growth, ordered the tree cut down and installed as a pillar in his palace, unaware that the tree contained Osiris's body. Now, meanwhile, Isis searched for Osiris, aided by Anubis, and came to know of Osiris's location by Byblos. Isis maneuvered herself into the favor of the king and queen and was granted a boon. She asked for the pillar in place in the palace hall, and upon being granted it, extracted the coffin from the pillar. She then consecrated the pillar, anointing it with myrrh and wrapping it in linen. The pillar came to be known as the Pillar of the Jed, Osiris. The Tet, or the Jed Pillar, is the oldest symbol of Osiris and was a great religious significance to the ancient Egyptians. It is a symbol of his backbone and his body in general. The Djed is represented in two ivory pieces found at Helvin during the first dynasty. Evidence that the use of this symbol is at least that old. Right, so the first dynasty. The Djed as a tree of life. Look at those depictions. 
Ooh, the Dijet associated with fertility, the phallus, umphalos, and tree of God, right? Taking this all the way back to the Sumerians as well. Now, the Dijet is actually a phallic symbol, and we can see, um, you know, with monoliths and all of that, right? The phallic symbolism still to this day, like the Washington Monument. Uh, the ceremonial raising the Dijet was enacted as a festival and renewal and fer fertility, ensuring a bountiful harvest and the appeasement of the gods. It is comparable to the Sumerian counterpart of the Timon, or temple, and equated with the potency and duration of the pharaoh's rule. In relation with the significance of the Jejed, we have a long line of pharaohs who took on the title of the Jejed in their name, including the legendary King Jejoser, uh, due to the Third Dynasty, from whom the very first step pyramid was built. It is generally hypothesized the prefix of DJ equates to serpent and wisdom, right? Serpent and wisdom. And disc jockey, that's writing um, the, the disc. Uh, it's actually an occult or an esoteric, an Illuminati term. Uh, the ankh, which is a symbol of life, or the thoracic vertebrate of a bull, which is also the cross, by the way. Uh, the jejed is a symbol of stability based on the sacrum of a bull's spine. Um, and the was, or the symbol and power and dominion, a staff made from the dried bull's penis. Right, and the phallic symbolism. Like I said, it's all about reproduction, you know, the semen, the sea foam, right? Um, and the serpent, the Ouroboros, right? The snake devouring its tail, the, the serpent's mouth is a vagina, and its tail is a penis. Um, over time, and it's uh, the Vesica Pisces and all of the reproduction, you know, looking at simulation theory and all of that, it's essentially that the Anunnaki gods made us male and female in the Garden of Eden. In the first book of Adam and Eve, um, mankind in his original state, the angels bowed down. They fell at our feet, right? We were neither, we were an androgyne. We were both male and female. You hear the story of Prometheus still in the sparks of life, um, jumping out of the, the cosmic womb or egg before his time, having both parts, right? Being perfect, uh, created by the gods, Lucifer, Prometheus, um, uh, you know, being the most beautiful angel and falling here on earth, right? Falling in consciousness, um, you know, so we see a lot of different variations of this, but in the bull goes back to, you know, age of Taurus and Enlil and all of that as well. But the aunt, the symbol of life or the keys, um, the, the vertebrate or sanctum, um, the thoracic vertebrate of the bull, the jed, the symbol of stability, the sacral sanctum, right? The, um, you know, uh, these are all part of the chakra system as well, and the wasp is the symbol of power of the staff made from the bull's penis without symbolism. Over time, the jed pillar came to represent more abstract, abstract ideas of stability and permanency, like the onk, which was a scepter, um, wasp scepter, hieroglyphs, commonly used in the sense with the decorative friezes. As the prehistorical history became recorded, we see various interpretations of the jed pillar. Now, the jed represents balance and stability. It has been interpreted as the backbone of the Egyptian god Osiris, especially in the form of Banab Dijet and the Ba of the Lord of Dijet and like uh, Wajet too, right? We've talked about that on this channel too, which I don't know if we'll get in that tonight, but we see Dijet, Dijidu, is the Egyptian name for Busiris or a center of the cult of Osiris. Uh, during the renewal festival, the Dijed would be ceremoniously raised as a phallic symbol, symbolizing the potency duration of the Pharaoh's rule. Um, and like I said, that first book about Adam and Eve, you know, in our fallen state, it was uh, the Anunnaki gods made us male and female as reproduction to create slave race, right? We, uh, the first book of uh, the Lost Book of Inky, right, where they do the genetic experiments on us, Inky does, and they have uh, the seven wives or whatever that, you know, uh, carry the, the children. He says you could, they could be monsters or not, and it's like, uh, eventually they mixed our genetics, and then uh, because they couldn't reproduce, make us over and over again, they made us male and female so we could reproduce, and it's like part of the fragmenting of the soul, right, making it smaller pieces. Um, 
you know, and if this was a soul trap and they're feeding off our energy, you know, uh, these conscious vampires or energy vampires, these gods or uh, demons or serpent beings, then that would be why to make us easier to feed off of. Um, it was sometimes surrounded by a, uh, and, and look at the Pharaoh's rule, it's been compared to the Sumerian concept of Tinan, the hieroglyph for the Jed may have given rise to Samek, Ptah, and Tatanin. They're also sometimes referred to as the Noble Dejed. It was sometimes surmounted by a small capital, or perhaps more correctly, uh, an abacus used to support the architrave. It often stands on a rectangular base. Some depictions of the pillar portray it with human arms holding the royal regalia. In representations in other instances, such as amulets, the Dejed pillar could be depicted as flat, but at other times it was produced as a fully round pillar. Think about the pillars, right, um, in the mysteries. In ancient Egypt, various theologies developed to encompass a number of different concepts, such as creation, uh, that were explained by various mythologies. These concepts sometimes varied by region or with time. For this reason, it is really somewhat difficult to determine how the concept of the Jed pillar actually originated in the prehistoric period, and it is likely that any such efforts are purely speculative or perhaps metaphoric. As a fetish symbol, it, uh, its origins seem to lie in the pre-dynastic period. Some scholars, such as Manfred Luker, have suggested that it might have originally represented a pole, uh, perhaps with fertility associations around which grain or corn was tied. And think about the poles as well. Um, you know, North Pole, South Pole, positive, negative, right? Um, poles are also very key, you know, in the pendulum of energy in the sacred sciences, right, and metaphysics. Ceremonial use, raising the Jeb pillar or the erection, right, of the phallic symbol here, and you can see it there. Uh, you know, and this takes us to, you know, sex magic and all that too, right, why those things were so important. Uh, a scene on the west wall of the Osiris Hall at Abydos shows the raising of the Jeb pillar. Once again, Isis and Seti. That's right, Seti. It was probably at Memphis that kings first performed a ceremony known as raising the Jejed pillar, which not only served as a metaphor for the stability of the monarch, but also symbolized the resurrection of Osiris. So, you know, the whole resurrection story goes way back to Egypt, Sumeria, all of this, right? Um, and it's also about, uh, you know, the astrology, the rising of the sun, right? Um, as well as the rising of the phallic symbol as well, and power and strength coming through that, as well as the Kundalini or serpent awakening in the spine, um, you know, creating the sacred secretion or opening of the third eye, the pineal gland, which is that pine cone you see uh, the gods holding in their, um, all the different depictions, right? Um, which is part of a process, the initiation process, you know, um, which we've talked about many times through the occult. Our best record of this ceremony comes from the depiction of the Cyrus Hall at Abydos. It was eventually incorporated into one of the said festivals at Amenhotep III at Thebes. The ceremony performed as early as the Middle Kingdom took place at a time when the flooding was at its height. Overall known as the Feast of Koyak, it began with an effigy of the dead god cast in gold and filled with a mixture of sand and grain. As the waters was receding from the inundation and grain was being planted in the land, the effigy was watered daily. Then for three days, it was floated on the waters of the Nile, right? Rising again three days later. And on the 24th day, the ancient Egyptian month of Koyak, it was placed in a coffin and laid in a grave. And on the 30th day, the effigy was actually buried. Okay? You see, this is like with the sun and all of that. Um, the seven-day delay represented God's seven-day gestation in the womb of Nut. And remember, it takes seven days of creation, a seven-day creation cycle as well. Uh, his mother, uh, on the last day, the king and priest raised the Jed pillar, the symbol of Osiris, and rejuvenation and strength apparently placed in the delta, known as the Jidu, Greek, Busiris. And that delta, once again, right? We talked about delta waves, right? And all of that. 
um, Delta variants too. Now the land would be fertile for yet another year. The next day marked the four month long season of Pert, which is going forth, during which the land appeared to rise up out of the floodwaters, allowing the fields to be planted. Okay. Now raising consciousness. The Dejed was considered necessary to aid in the transformation of, and look at that, how cool, the physical body into its spiritual form of consciousness and light. And that is a process of ascension, transfiguration, transformation, right? Raising the Kundalini. It was speculated that throughout ancient Egypt, the common belief was that semen was reproduced in the spinal fluids. Hence, the worship of the erect spine as a symbol of cosmic regeneration. This practice continued on with the Hindu traditions of Kundalini enlightenment and awakening the fire serpent which resides in the chakras. And think about the Tantra too, right? Tantra, a lot of people associate that with you know, sex and sex magic, right? Someone's Tantra is their Kundalini energy um, and the Ankh, um, a lot of the thoughts of the Ankh too is, you know, Ankh in one's sexual energy whenever they were, you know, came to orgasm. Um, those who were initiates of old, uh, masters of old, when they came to orgasm, they could Ankh their sexual energy up over their head and back into their body and only create a child or release their seed um, at will. In essence, right? Release their seed at will whenever they wanted to reproduce or make a copy of themselves. And then they would give up themselves and pass on. You know, we've seen like from Osiris to Horus, right? The being reborn as a new person. This you know, kind of goes into reincarnation and all of that. Um, but we see uh, the awakening or the fire serpent, which is a seraphim. And we look at uh, the burning bush as well, right? Um, Moses, the burning bush, and he threw down the staff, and it became a serpent that devoured its own tail. Okay, the serpent was the raising of the kundalini, the third eye being opened. If thine eye be single, then thy whole body be filled with light. Those are the words of Christ, you know. So, I mean, we're seeing all these different connections, and even so much as the archons being made of the smokeless fire, right? The, the jed in architecture. Um, and remember the Jed or Jedi, right? These were like the old, you know, mystery spiritual warriors and teachers. In the old kingdom, the pillar was shown, and in, in these teachings coming from Sumeria to Egypt, right, ancient Babylonia, right, to um, you know the Middle East, to all over the world, right. These mysteries are the same, but they kind of originate here, and this is one of the foundations, you know, where this started. Um, and Egypt and the mystery schools there and Hermes and Toth. This is like, you know, worldwide. All the, all the spiritual teachers are all just said the Buddha and Christ and all these spiritual teachers came there for their, their enlightenment. Plato, right? Um, in the Old Kingdom, the pillar was shown in wall decorations at the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. And these drawings of the Jed pillars were shown in the Royal Palace where they formed columns supporting windows. When one looked through the windows, the pillars gave the appearance of holding up the sky beyond, also found at Saqqara. The arches, right? Ark, or Ark of the Covenant, right? Arch also uh, is another word for affirmative, by the way. Ptah who is sometimes described as the noble, the Jed, right? Ptah, the god of wisdom and knowledge. Um, many believe this is Enki, his son being Toth, right, or Marduk. Ptah is often depicted as holding the Jed symbol as a staff. This means kingship, right, royalty, uh, hierarchical, spiritual, um, you know, hierarchy. And lending further to priesthood, uh, lending further support to this theory are the bands found below the crossbars of some of the Jed pillars that correspond to the papyrus and other columns in ancient temples, which symbolically held together the papyrus stalks. It should be noted that the four gods who were responsible for holding up the sky were the four sons of Horus, and these are the four winds, the four horsemen, or the four 
cardinal directions, uh, north, east, west, south, you call it news, right? Or media, the medium between man and the heavens, right? And, um, uh, you know, in the Tetragrammaton, Yadhod Vadhe, the name of Yehovah or God, right? These are the four, right, angles or angels, right, as well. So the four elements also. So, I mean, they, they break down into quite a few different things. You know, we see like the Aryans and the God of the Air and Marduk and we talked about the East. Um, you know, a lot of different depictions of these gods and worship of these gods over time, right? And this kind of goes back to the mysteries as well. Understanding the mysteries, you know, understanding, you know, um, you know and that's what the angles is all about in the physical world, right, uh, as well. You know? um, and that's why you see the Masonic angle, you know, the compass and the angle, or the curves and the angles. Um, it should be noted that the four gods who were responsible for holding up the sky were the four sons of Horus. You think of Atlas or of the Atlantic, right? Poseidon, uh, Atlantis, right, as well, holding up the world, holding up the sky. It's also noted that they were associated with the four canopic jars that contained the organs of the dead. The organs also correlate to the constellations, which also correlate to um, the astral, which also correlate to the collective spiritual, the individual spiritual. Uh, and the metaphysical and the depictions of the jet pillars adorning the exterior of the chest that held the jars They also provided various services to the dead in the afterlife strongly relating them to Osiris and most of these rituals that we see on the um, Egypt um, Pyramid walls are rituals to be performed when alive. I believe uh, the Isis knot The Isis knot or Tiet is also called the blood of Isis is believed to be stylized rendering of female genitalia, um, symbolizing the womb of the goddess. Isis was the wife of Osiris, the god of nature, death, and resurrection, whose backbone was the Jejed pillar. And you see, it's a vajayjay. It's a vajayjay. Right? See? The lips there. Mm, yeah. Right? The female genitalia. And that's for the feminine or the goddess worship, um, mother worship, uh, the Virgin Mary, right? Which the, the Virgo constellation and Bethlehem, the house of bread, also in the constellation of Virgo. Um, the four rungs of the Jejed pillar represent the four elements and dimensions of the creative world. Embodying the divine masculine and creative feminine principles, the Tiet Knot and the Jejed Pillar together provided powerful protection and were two of the most popular amulets in ancient Egypt. This takes us to Isis as an archetype for the female creator, blood, human bloodline stories, which we trace from Egypt and Mother Mary, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And... All right, yeah, sorry guys, I had to uh, pause the video uh, really quick. I had a phone call um, uh, starting some new work here. So this takes us to the, the female creator, right? Blood, um, human bloodline stories and all that. And so, uh, which we're about to get into Isis and all that here in a second. The Jed at the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. You can see light bulbs, electricity. You know, a lot of things were not what we're told they were and many people believe that the, the great pyramids are not half as old as what you know is believed um horus connecting uh the pillar with the loop and the ankh the jed pillar and geometry and we see you know the pentagram there which is venus lucifer the similar portrayal of the jed of osiris here the god's body is the jed the eyes, um, the plumet, horns, sun disc, breastplates, and pectoral all adorning the pillar. This is that Abydos. Right? And this is also uh, whenever um, we look at, um, it's the Kabbalah tree, right? The Kabbalah tree. You see the Kabbalah tree right here in the Jed as well, right?
These are my brother, the, the pillar there. The Atef crowns. The Jejedin Egyptian barge, and we see this depicted a lot too. This is where I've showed you guys a depiction of Jupiter and uh, Set and um, Apophis or Apep, Apepi. Uh, the Jejedin Egyptian barge, the funnels, cones, horns, harmonics of creation, or the Twelve, which is a zodiacal wheel as well. Right? These are cyclonic. We always talk about you know hurricanes, cyclones. Right? This electromagnetism, you know, um, orbits. Uh, astronomy and astrology too you know it's right there uh, this image above shows the anchor of the two horizons the two lion-headed sphinx like figures facing opposite directions falling on the leo virgo and aquarius pisces equinox axis and crossed by the jejed pillar marking the galactic meridian of the center or the edge and this arrangement, the celestial polar axis, does fix the midpoint of the Ankar and the place where the Jejed rises. But the Jejed orientation itself is 90 degrees, 90 degrees, the four angles, or angels, from the polar axis. This shows a Tim's has intuited the corrected orientation of the primal Jed and its connection with the great cross of the galactic alignment, right, in the cross, um, iron cross, uh, Christian cross, you know, so this is is always uh, kind of the same you know no matter what what school of thought you take it to here um, we're actually going to look here now Black Isis. Now, Isis and looking at Black Isis is all things in our reality have positive and negative polarities. Archetypical Isis is portrayed as having dual aspects of light and dark, uh, which link magic, illusion, time, and the alchemy of consciousness in the simulation of time and reality. Out of Africa, Isis would be portrayed as a dark-skinned woman, whereas in modern times she's dep depicted as fair-skinned. Black Isis was a magician, possibly the archetype for the high priestess of the tarot. Uh, she learned her magic from Toth, although, according to some legends, she obtained her power from Ra himself by tricking him into revealing his name to her, thus acquiring his full magical knowledge. The Ankh used by Isis with her initiates may account for some of the oddly shaped scepters carried by the Black Virgins. And we see this like Black Madonna, Madonna worship. Um, Divine Tem Knights Templars, you see a lot of the mysteries go with this, right? The Black Isis worship. It's way deeper than most people even uh, can imagine. Um, and just kind of looking at this too, like this is your, your trickster, um, you know, Lucifer. This is another Lucifer uh, incarnation as well. Isis. <clears throat> Isis is the feminine archetype for creation. She's the goddess of fertility and motherhood. She's gone by many names and played many roles in history and mythology as goddess and female creator. Her name literally comes from the queen of the throne. Her original headdress was empty. A throne chair belonging to her murdered husband, Osiris. As a personification of the throne, she was an important source of the pharaoh's power. The pharaoh was depicted as her child, who sat on the throne she provided. Her cult was popular throughout Egypt, but the most important sanctuaries were at Bebet al Hegar in the Nile Delta, and beginning with the reign of Nektangibo on the island of Philae in Upper Egypt. In the Philae, right, Philadelphia, Phi, right, Phi, the pentagram, right, that starfish body. Uh, the hieroglyph for her name is originally used or meant female of flesh, i.e. mortal, as she may simply have represented uh, uh, deified real queens. The most commonly used name for this deity, Isis, is a Greek corruption of the Egyptian name and its pronunciation is Isis, and its further corruption by English speakers. The true Egyptian pronunciation is unknown. An Egyptian hieroglyph only recorded consonants and left out the vowels. 
Uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics for her name are commonly translated as gist or as an inconvenience as a convenience. Egyptologists pronounce that as Iset. Iset. And Isis is often shown as the mother of Horus, the hulk headed god of war and protection. See the depiction there? She's depicted suckling him, much like the depiction of the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus. Isis was regarded as a companion of Osiris, whose soul dwelt in the star Sa or Orion. And the symbol of Isis in the heavens was Sirius, known colloquially as the Dog Star. Dogon, the dog, Lucifer. Remember, God is dog reversed. Dog is God reversed. Reflecting its prominence in its constellation, Canis Major, or Big Dog, Sirius was greatly beloved because its appearance marked out not only the beginning of the new year, but announced the annual inundation of the Nile, which signified renewed wealth and prosperity for Egypt. As for the power which uh, shot forth in the Nile flood, she was called Sati, as the embracer of the land and producer of fertility by her water, she was called Anket, and the goddess cultivated lands in the field, she was Seket, and the goddess of harvest, she was Renanet, and one linked to rebirth was associated with the phoenix, um, and as a producer and giver of life, she was Anket, and the great lady of the underworld, who assisted in transforming the bodies of the blessed dead into those wherein to live in the realms of Osiris, she was Ament, the hidden goddess mother of Ra. In this capacity, she shared with Osiris the attribute of the giver of life, providing food for the dead as well for the living. Um, and you know what, if you think of like the female in hell or whatever, right, it takes you like to um, Persephone, right, with Hades, right, it's like uh, the phonetics or sound, right, you can also kind of see sound being associated with this divine feminine, or this dark feminine um, in light, uh, being with like the thunder god or lightning god, the sky god. Um, masculine. Uh, as comparatively early period in Egyptian history, Isis had absorbed the attributes of the great primitive goddess of all the local goddesses, such as Nekbet, Uachet, Net, Bast, Hathor, etc. And she was even identified as a female counterpart of the primeval abyss of water, from which sprang all life. Um, and think about that, you know, the king of the abyss, right, Abaddon, Apollyon, uh, Samael, who pursued chaos in the abyss. The impossible to limit the attribute of Isis, who possesses the powers of the water goddess, earth goddess, and corn goddess. In the water would be the lord of water, would be uh, Ea, right? And the lord of uh, the earth, Inki, right? Earth goddess, water goddess. That would be the feminine aspect of him. Star goddess, queen of the underworld, lord of the underworld as well. And a woman, she united herself in one or more of the attributes of all the goddesses in Egypt known to us. Isis was venerated first in Egypt, the only goddess worshipped by all the Egyptians alike, and whose influence was so widespread that she had become completely syncretic with the Greek goddess Demeter, and after the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, the Hellenization of the Egyptian culture initiated by Ptolemy uh, Soter, Isis eventually became known as the Queen of Heaven, right, and that Queen of Heaven worship is big. You know, especially in the mysteries and the cults. Um, following the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, the worship of Isis spread throughout the Greco-Roman world. Uh, Tactus wrote, right after Julius Caesar's assassination, the temple in honor of Isis had been decreed. Augustus suspended this and tried to turn Romans back to the Roman deities who were closely associated with the state. Eventually, the Emperor Caligula abandoned the Augustan wariness toward what was described as Oriental cults and was in his reign with the Isaiah festival of the Navigum, Isidis, was established in Rome. According to Josephus, which would also be set, right, um, Josephus, um, or Seth, or Setian, right, Caligula donned female garb and took part in the mysteries he instituted. In the Hellenistic age, Isis acquired a new rank as a leading goddess of the Mediterranean world. Vespian, along with Titus, practiced incubation in the Roman Iseum. Uh, Domitian built another Iseum along with the Serapum. 
Uh, Trajan appears before Isis and Horus, presenting them with votive offerings of wine and uh, boss relief on the triumph arch in Rome. Hadrian decorated his via in Tibor with Isaiac scenes, and Galerius regarded Isis as his protector. Roman perspectives on cults were syncretic seen in new deities, merely local aspects of a familiar one. For many Romans, Egyptian Isis was an aspect of the Phrygian Sibyl, whose uh, orgiastic rites were long naturalized at Rome, so her orgies. Um, indeed, she was known as the Isis of 10,000 names. Among these names are Roman Isis, Queen of Heaven, outstanding for its long and continuous history. Herodotus identified the Greek with the Roman goddesses of agriculture and Demeter and Ceres. In later years, in the temples throughout Europe, Africa, and Asia, the alabaster statue of Isis from the 3rd century BCE found in Ohrid in the Republic of Macedonia is, depend, is depicted on the obverse of the Macedonian 10 dinars banknote issued in 96. The male first name was Isidore and means in Greek, gift of Isis, similar to Theodore, God's gift. The name, which became common in Roman times, survived the suppression of the Isis worship and remains popular up to the present, G being among others in the names of several Christian saints. The Isis cult in Rome was a template for the Christian Madonna cult. And we just talked about the Madonna cult. You see the origins here, right? In this typical form uh, of her myth. Isis was the first daughter of Geb, right? The god of the earth and Newt, right? Had it, Newt, right? Newt, Nox, Pan, god of the sky or goddess of the sky. And we think about Luna, right? The night god, nocturnal god, and Newt, Geb, Gadriel, um, or Gab, right? And she was born on the fourth intercalary day and she married her brother, Osiris, and she deceived Horus by him. Isis was instrumental in the resurrection of Osiris when he was murdered by Set. Using her magical skills, she restored his body to life after having gathered the body parts that had been thrown about the earth by Set. And think about it too. Mary Magdalene, who was a prostitute, you know, Isis with the, you know, um, the, the feminine, right, and Osiris' resurrection. Christ's resurrection, you know, putting the pieces back together, just kind of interesting. Um, you know, most Egyptian deities were first worshipped by local cults. Eventually, their popularity spread so that major cities, towns in Egypt were known as the home of the particular deity. The origins of the cult of Isis are uncertain, but it's believed she's originally an independent and popular deity in pre-dynastic times prior to 3100 BCE at Sibeninidos in the Nile Delta. The first written references to Isis date back to the 5th dynasty of Egypt based on the association of her name with the throne. Some early Egyptologists believe that Isis's original function was that of the throne mother. However, more recent scholarship suggests the aspects of the role came later by association and in many African tribes the throne is known as the mother of the king and the concept fits well with either theory possibly giving insight into the thinking of ancient Egyptians. The Isis Osiris myth became very important during the Greco-Roman period with sanctuaries in Delos and Pompeii. It was believed that the Nile River flooded every year because of the tears of sorrow which Isis wept for Osiris. Osiris's death and rebirth was relived each year through rituals. The worship of Isis eventually spread through the Greco-Roman world, continuing until the suppression of paganism in the Christian era. And that takes us to Osiris. Right? Osiris, the god of death here. And Osiris, who is represented in his most developed form of iconography, wearing the Atef crown, which is similar to the white crown of Upper Egypt. But with the addition of two curling ostrich feathers at each side, he carries the crook and flail. He is commonly depicted as a green rebirth or black void complexioned pharaoh in mummy form wearing the trappings of mummification from chest downward and the feathers um you know we see the you know the minerval owl you know owl feathers um also uh when we see uh, uh feathers as well you know flying serpents feathered serpents okay uh green emerald uh lucifer Right. Toe, knowledge, 
um, black, darkness, death, Satan, okay? And the wrapping depiction of the amphibious gods. And this takes us to the Dogon and all of this, guys, right? Sumerian. Um, these are all fish gods, fish hats. We still see this in, uh, you know, uh, the Vatican. For those who study the ancient alien theory, Osiris and the pantheon of Egyptian gods were aliens who were masked to conceal their identities in the alchemy and magic of reality. We are all playing the mythical matrix of their illusion. And do we think they actually were masked? I doubt that. Um, I think it would be way more likely that they were genetically altered or genetic experiments or amalgamations of different, you know, deities kind of put together, you know, so... And the birds are like Jupiter, he has the eagles and all of this, right? The same kind of gods play out over and over and over. The funerary scene, the merciful judge of the dead, right? God of resurrection, the underworld and the afterlife. The patron of pharaohs, agriculture, fertility, the annual flooding of the Nile. The first child of Geb and Nut, the brother of Seth, Nephthys, and Isis, who was also his wife. Father of Horus by Isis. Father of Anubis by Nephthys. Osiris, Asar, Aser, Osar, Osir, Wasir, or Osir. Attestations of his name. Palerno Stone, 2500 BC. Pyramid Text, 2400 BC. Shabaka Stone, the writings of Plutarch. Hieroglyphs, reliefs, stella paintings, and papyri. The myth of Osiris and Isis. See the little depictions here. Definitely do not look human. I'm <laughs> just saying. The family of Osiris. Osiris on a lapis lazuli pillar. In the middle flanked by Horus on the left. And Isis on the right and Louvre Paris. The myth has been told in various ways. But the message is always the same. Death and resurrection, a metaphor for the journey of the soul and the game of physical reality. Uh, Plutarch recounts one version of the myth surrounding the cult in which set fooled Osiris into getting into a box, which he then shut, had sealed or lead, and threw into the Nile, or the sarcophagi, or based on the box in the myth. And think about Pandora's box as well, or the cube god, cube Allah, right? Kabbalah. Hugh Father, Allah, you know, Muslim, Islam, right, which is Saturn, Satan, Satan, um, Osiris's wife, and that would also be Set, right, um, the temple of Set. Um, Osiris's wife, Isis, searched for his remains until she finally found him embedded in a tree trunk which was holding in the roof of the palace of Byblos in the Phoenician coast. She, in you know, many people believe that, you know, the Phoenicians actually lived in the Americas. That's why we see a lot of the, the glyphs, um, you know, in America. Um, you know, in that uh, perhaps Christ, you know, was a Phoenician. Um, you know, uh, many people believe there's, you know, many different you know, possibilities when it comes to that. At the very least, he was, you know, from Lebanon, you know, and that's where the original Bethlehem was, and that the Bethlehem, you know, that many people believe didn't exist until 300 years after Christ's death, right? And that we all know that these are astrological events as well, you know, Virgo and the House of Bread and all that. Um, months later, oh, okay, the Biblos on the Phoenician coast, she managed to remove the coffin and open it, but Osiris is already dead. She used a spell she had learned from her father and brought him back to life so he could impregnate her. After they finished, he died again, so she hid his body in the desert. And think about the initiation ritual, right? Going into the desert because it's believed the desert is where all the elements are separate, right? Water is separated from the soil, right? They don't mix. Um, the air is separated from the water. There's no moisture in the air. They don't mix. Um, months later, uh, she gave birth to, in the elements being the, the feminine or physical expression of God, right? Um, uh, she gave birth to Horus while she was off raising him. She had been out hunting one night and came across the body of Osiris. Enraged, he tore the body into 14 pieces and scattered them throughout the land. Isis gathered up all the parts of the body 
lest the phallus, which was eaten by a fish, thereafter considered taboo by the Egyptians, and the fish, or Piscean age, right, in the procession of the equinox, the phallic symbolism, okay, um, and bandaged uh, them together for a proper burial. The gods were impressed by the devotion of Isis and then resurrected Osiris as a god of the underworld because of his death and resurrection. Osiris is associated with the flooding and retreating of the Nile and thus the crops along the Nile Valley. Um, Diodorus Siccubus gives another version of the myth in which Osiris describes as an ancient king who taught the Egyptians the arts of civilization, including agriculture. Osiris is murdered by his evil brother Set when Diodorus associates with the evil typhoon or typhon typhonian beast in greek mythology typhon divides the body into 26 pieces which he distributes amongst his fellow conspirators in order to implicate them in the murder isis and horus avenge the death of osiris and slay typhon isis recovers all the parts of Osiris's body lest the phallus and secretly buries them. She made replicas of them and distributed them to several locations, which then became centers of Osiris worship, right? And that'd be the 13 twice, right? The 26th. The tale of Osiris becoming fish-like is tied with the story of the Greek shepherd or the god Pan becoming fish-like from the waist down in the same river Nile after being attacked by Typhon. This attack was part of a generational feud with both Zeus and Dionysus, which were dismembered by Typhon in a similar manner as Osiris was by Set in Egypt and Dionysus to Christ and Zeus and Jupiter and all of it, right? It's always the same um, story, different names. Osiris was viewed as the one who died to save the many, right? Uh, who rose from the dead, the rose, and on the long line it significantly affected man's view of the world and expectations of an afterlife, right? Died to save many, rose from the dead. Passion and Resurrection. Uh, scholars such as E.A. Wallace Budge have suggested possible connections or parallels of Osiris' resurrection story with those found in Christianity. The Egyptians of every period in which they are known to us believed that Osiris was of divine origin. Um, that he suffered death and mutilation at the hands of the powers of evil, that after a great struggle with these powers, he rose again, right? And, um, you know, this is uh, Odin, right? Many gods, you know, have done this. Uh, Toth, the Atlantean priest king, right? And became henceforth the king of the underworld and judge of the dead, and that he has conquered death, and the righteous also might conquer death. In the Osiris, the Christian, Egyptians found the prototype of Christ in the pictures and statues of Isis suckling her son, Horus, to perceive the prototype of the Virgin Mary and her child. Yeah, you can see the, the connection there. It's very obvious, actually. You know, assuming beings of the Temple of Abydos, Aliens and ancient aircrafts, you see the craft there. Osiris was worshipped widely throughout all of Egypt, his cult center at Abydos until things changed politically. The cult of Osiris continued until the 6th century AD on the island of Philae in the upper Nile because of Theodician decree, 380 AD, to destroy all pagan temples and force worshippers to accept Christianity was not enforced there. This lasted until the time of Justinian. The ceremonies were about rebirth. You know, the solar barge and the wormhole. The eye symbology. The all-seeing eye. It's all about death and resurrection. One of Osiris' symbols is the Dejed. Wake up! Sorry, guys. The Dejed is a type of pillar what is usually understood as a backbone of, Os quit, Mika, of Osiris. And at the same time, the Nile, the backbone of Egypt, the Nile supplying water, and Osiris strongly connected to the vegetation who died only to be resurrected and represented of uh, con continuity and therefore stability. Mika! Come here, stop, girl. The Great Pyramid and the Dejed of Osiris. Come here, girl. 
Yeah, I see Mika. Uh, the Great Pyramid. It's okay. And the Belt Stars of Orion. And the Warrior and the Shepherd. Osiris is Orion. Isis is Sirius. Jeez. Mika, be nice. Sounds <coughs> bad. Mika, stop! <laughs> All right, and we're going to move forward here. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Uh, next, we're going to jump into the journey of the bloodline. You know, we're going to take a look at the bloodlines here. Um, since the beginning, the story of humanity has been about ancient bloodlines, the blue and the gold from the Middle East to Egypt and to Europe and across the global landscape. There does exist a genetically engineered bloodline, and some believe it contains extraterrestrial genetics, um, the place one would look for the answers. You can see here. King Tutankhamun, and this goes back to Akhenaten, right? Moses, okay? I believe Moses was Akhenaten. Uh... I do not believe they found a lost golden city, just another interesting site. Something to help restore the tarnished name and reputation. Yeah. Blue Bloods. Start with the Blue Bloods here. Blue Bloods, Bloodlines, and Royalties. Uh, Tutmos III, which is Thoth is born, ascended to the throne of Egypt and ruled for almost 54 years. He was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, which included Tutankhamun, or King Tut, Queen Hashtiput, and Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled with Queen Nefertiti. Their sarcophagi will never be found. We look at the Aten, the Lord of Heaven and Lord of Earth. The Aten, or Aten, was the disk of the sun in ancient Egypt mythology and the originally an aspect of Ra. Uh, he became the deity of the monotheistic, in fact, monistic religion of Atenism of Amhotep IV and who took the name Akhenaten. The worship of Aten seemed to stop shortly after Akhenaten's death in his poem, Hymn to Aten. Akhenaten praises Aten as a creator and giver of life. This is the sun disc, sun worship, the Aten. This is the disc, the disc jockey, right? Um, black hole or star, right? Aten was the life-giving force, or, you know, um, you can even look at it as a vortex, too. Um, the life-giving force of light. The full title of Akhenaten's god was the Ra Horus, who rejoices in the horizon. In his or her name of the light which is seen in the sun disk. This is the title of the god as it appears on the numerous stela which was placed to mark the boundaries of Akhenaten's new capital at Amarna or Akat Akhetaten. This lengthy name was often shortened to Ra Horus Aten or just Aten in many texts, but the god of Akhenaten raised to supremacy is considered a synthesis of very ancient gods viewed in a new and different way. Both Ra and Horus characteristics are part of the god, but the god is also considered to be both masculine and feminine simultaneously. All creation was thought to emanate from the god and to exist within the god. In particular, the god was not depicted in anthropomorphic form or human form, but as rays of light extending from the sun's disk. Furthermore, the god's name came to be written with a katush, along with the titles normally given to Pharaoh, another break with ancient tradition. This, you know, Nostradamus talks about Rapaz, right? Um, Ra, right? Uh, Israel is Ra El, Isis, Ra, Elohim, right? The, and think about this, the monotheism, the father or founder of monotheism, Moses or Moshe, right? He goes up on Mount Hermon, Mount Sinai, Mount Olympus, right? The Mount, 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 right? Same thing, um, you know, uh, swearing the oath or the watchers, right? With uh, Azazel, um, you know, the leader of the watchers uh, with Marduk, um, 
you know, but I could not, you know, the monotheism, the, the sun god, the, the disc, right? Um, both Ra and Horus characteristics are part of the god, but in, uh, but the god is also considered to be both masculine and feminine simultaneously. The Aten or the sun disc first appears in text dating to the 12th dynasty, the story of Sanu, where the deceased king is described as rising as god to the heavens and uniting with the sun disc, the divine body merging with its marker. Right, the deceased king rising again, right, uniting with the sun disc, Ra going up into the sky, Marduk going up into the sky. Uh, Ra Horus, more usually referred to as Ra Hercati, and, or Hercules, Heracati, Heracles, right, uh, Hermes. Ra, who is Horus of the two horizons, is a synthesis of two other gods, both of which are attested from very early on, and I believe all the gods uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Um, you know, uh, the sun, all of it, Jupiter, Saturn, it's all, you know, Neptune, Uranus, they're variations of, you know, the good and evil, the masculine, feminine, right, the dark and the light, you know, Satan and Jupiter, basically Inky and Enlil, the two brothers, the, the, the two heroes, the twins, you know, red and blue, solar, lunar, uh, light and dark, masculine, feminine, it goes on and on, right, we see this in every religious variation we'll show this so many times we'll go through these videos i hope that you guys enjoyed last week right with um you know talking about new age versus luciferianism right because now we're going to actually get into these mysteries right after we get par past the fucking stigma of you know is it evil to look at this shit you know it's like now let's look at the mysteries and see all the connections between the different religions right we're going to go through every fucking religion i'm going to do deep dives on it all Okay, so every week we're going to have a new one, you know, two, three hours worth of a deep dive, you know. Um, yeah, Ra Horus, referred to as Ra Hergati, or to horizons, to other gods. During the Armarna period, the synthesis was in the invisible source of energy, or the sun god, of which visible manifestation was the Aten, the solar disk. Thus, Ra Horus Aten was a development of old ideas which came gradually. Ra Horus Aten is Ra El, right? The real change, as some see it, was the apparent abandonment of all other gods above all Amun in the introduction of monotheism by Akhenaten, Amun Ra. The syncretism is readily apparent in the great hymn to the Aten in which Ra Hercati, Shu and Aten are merged into the Creator God. Others see Akhenaten as a practitioner of an Aten uh, model tree. During the Armana period, the Aten was given a royal titulary and considered the king of all, which his names drawn in cartouche. And there were two forms of this title. First had the names of the other gods. Second, later, which was singular, referred to Aten himself. The early form was Ra Horkadi, which rejoices in the horizon. His name was Shu, which is Aten. The later was Ray, the ruler of the two horizons of the light, which is the Aten. And we're going to look at all of this, by the way. So we're going to look at Ra and, you know, kind of show you the different depictions. It's fucking nuts when you get down to it, you know, honestly. Uh, the Aten is just kind of where it begins, you know. And all of these dynasties, you know, going back to, you know, Akhenaten. And we look at Akhenaten, the dynasties of Akhenaten, the 8th dynasty of Egypt, Pharaoh Akhenaten. We'll take a look. Akhenaten meaning living spirit of Aten. Known before the fifth year of the reign as Amhotep IV. Sometimes given its Greek form, Amenophis IV. The meaning of Amun is satisfied. Was a pharaoh, and think about Moon, right? Uh, of the dynasty of the Egypt who ruled for 17 years and died perhaps in 1336 BC or 1334. He's especially noted for abandoning traditional e Egyptian polytheism and introducing worship entered or centered on the Aten, which is sometimes described as monotheistic or henotheistic, and an early inscription likens him to the sun as compared to the stars, and later official language avoids calling the Aten as a god, given the solar deity status above mere gods. He was born Amhotep III, and his chief queen, uh, Taiyi, was their younger son. Akhenaten was not originally designated as the successor to the throne until the untimely death of his older brother. Tutmos, Amhotep IV, succeeded his father after Amhotep III's death at the end of his 38-year reign, possibly after a short corrigency lasting between either one to two years. Um, Pharaoh Akhenaten was known to be the heretic king, 
Uh, the 10th king of the 18th dynasty, Egyptologist, still trying to figure out what actually happened during his life. Much of the truth was buried after he died. Akhenaten lived at the peak of the Egypt's imperial glory. Egypt had never been richer, more powerful, and more secure. Up and down the Nile, workers built hundreds of temples to pay homage to the gods. They believed that if the gods were pleased, Egypt would prosper. And so it did. Family. Amhotep III and Queen Tai. Akhenaten and his family lived in the great religious center of Thebes, the city of the god Amun. There were thousands of priests who served the gods. Religions was a business of the time, many earning their living connected to the worship of gods. All indications as that a child, Akhenaten was a family outcast. Scientists are studying the fact that Akhenaten suffered from a disease called Marfan syndrome, a genetic defect that damages the body's uh, connective tissue. Symptoms include short torso, long head, necks, arms, feet. Yeah, I doubt that. I think he was just an alien. Just to keep it real. Pot belly, heavy thighs, poor muscular tone. It's because he looks like a fucking gray. Right? That's why, guys. Honestly, it's really crazy. Marfan's disease. No, he was just not human, probably. And he was probably half God. You know, a blue blood, like we were talking about. And one of the fallen. <laughs> you know, just to keep it real. A genetic experiment, even. Who knows? Yeah. Um, that's why all of the worship changed, right, to the serpent worship we see now. Those who inherit awfully are usually are tall, blah, blah, blah. They can die at an early age. If Akhenaten had the disease, he used to put his daughters in a 50 50 chance of inheriting it. That's why his daughters are shown with similar symptoms. They're not human either, right? If they're bad. Akhenaten was a son of Amhotep III and Queen Tai, a descendant of the Hebrew tribe. The largest statue in the Cairo Museum shows Amhotep III and his family. He and Queen Tai, pronounced T, had four daughters, two sons. Akhenaten's brother, Tutmosis, or Moses, was later named his high priest of Memphis. Moses was later, later named his high priest of Memphis. The other son, Amhotep IV, uh, later to take the name Akhenaten, seemed to be ignored by the rest of the family. He never appeared in any portraits, was never taken to public events. He received no honors, as if the god Amun had excluded him. He was rejected by the world for some unknown reason. He had never shown with his family or mentioned on monuments, yet his mother favored him. In 1352 BC, Akhenaten ascended the throne, succeeding his father, Amhotep III, who had died. Akhenaten was just a teenager at the time, but it was the desire of Queen T that he ruled. In some version of the story, it is written, the father and son shared the throne briefly. Um, Akhenaten's reign lasted 16 years. This was a difficult time in Egyptian history. Many scholars maintain that Akhenaten was responsible for this decline, but evidence suggests it had already started. Akhenaten is principally famous for the relig religious reforms, where the polytheism, polytheism of Egypt was to be supplanted by monotheism, centered around Aten, the god of the solar disk. This was possibly a move to lessen the political power of the priest. Now the pharaoh, not the priesthood, was the sole link between the people and Aten, which effectively ended the power of the various temples. And he took church out of the, the fucking, you know, scenario. And think about his brother, uh, which had the name Moses, right? Aka Moses or whatever, you know. Come on now. It was Moses, guys. I'm just saying. I, I've been saying this for years before I even knew his brother's name was that. You know, to Moses. Um, you know, it's, and it's very crazy to even see, you know, honestly. Um, and when we think about, you know... Uh, Hebrew and how it comes from Sumerian and Egypt and all of that, you know, and these religions all come from the same places. Akhenaten built his temple to his god Aten immediately outside the east gate of the east of the air, the Aryan race, Marduk, right, um, which is Yahweh, uh, the temple of Karnak, but clearly the coexistence of the two cults could not last. He therefore proscribed the cult of Amun, closed the god's temples, and took over the revenues. He then sent his officials around to destroy Amun's statues and desecrate the worship sites. These actions were so contrary to the traditions that the opposition arose against him. The estates of the great temples of Thebes, Memphis, Heliopolis reverted to the throne. Corruption grew out of the mismanagement of such large levies. Nefertiti. Who Akhenaten's chief wife was Nefertiti. 
Many world fans by the discovery of her exquisitely molded and painted bust, now displayed at the Altus Museum of Berlin, and among the most recognized works of surviving from the ancient world, Queen Nefertiti has often referred to as the most beautiful woman in the world. The Berlin bust seen from two different angles is indeed the most famous depiction of Queen Nefertiti found in the workshop of the famed sculptor Tutmos. The bust is believed to be a sculptor's model. The technique, which begins with a carved piece of limestone, requires the stone core to be first plastered and then richly painted. Flesh tones on the face give the bust life. Her full lips are enhanced by the bold red, although the crystal inlay is missing from her left eye. Both eyelids and brows are outlined in black. Her gracefully elongated neck balances a tall, flat top crown, which adorns her sleek Head. The vibrant colors of her necklace and crown contrast the yellow brown of her smooth skin. While everything is sculpted to perfection, the one flaw is of the broken left ear. It's uh, the remarkable sculpture still in existence. This is why Nefertiti is the most beautiful woman in the world. The origins uh, are confusing. It has been suggested that T was also her mother. Another suggestion that Nefertiti was Akhenaten's cousin. Um, her wet nurse was the wife of the vizier, who would have been T's brother, and sometimes called himself the god's father, suggesting that he might have been Akhenaten's father-in-law. However, uh, I never specifically refers to himself as the father of Nefertiti, although there are references that Nefertiti's sister, uh, Mutnom, is featured prominently in the decorations of the tomb of I, uh, and we will never know the truth of this bloodline. Perhaps they didn't even know each other. And this is kind of one of the more famous depictions here. The shrine Stella, also from the early part of the Armana period, depicts Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and Princess Meritaten, uh, Merkitan, and Ankisenpaten, worshipping the Aten as a family. Dorothea Arnold, in her article, Aspects of the Royal Fam Female Image during the Armana period, discusses the plethora of reliefs depicting intimate family moments. While Akhenaten leans forward to give Merikitan a kiss, Merikitan plays on her mother's lap and gazes up lovingly. The Armana letters are consistent of cuneiform tablets, mostly written in Akkadian. This is from the writing system of ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. And these are um, the letters of Egypt of Armana, the modern name of the Egypt's capital of Akhenaten, founded by Pharaoh Akhenaten during the 8th century. Um, there are 24 further tablets that have been recovered since the Norwegian historiologist Georgian uh, Alexander Knudsen's landmark edition. These letters consist of the cuneiform tablets written in Akkadian, the language and diplomacy of the period G, were discovered by local Egyptians who secretly dug most of the ruined city as they were originally stored in the ancient building of archaeologists. The first was successfully recovered with the tablets in 1891 who found 21 fragments. Um, the tablets originally recovered by local Egyptians have been scattered among museums in Egypt, Cairo, the U.S. The full archive, which includes correspondence from the preceding reign of Amhotep III as well, contained over 300 diplomatic letters, the remainder of miscellaneous or literary educational materials. The tablets shed much light on the Egyptian relations with Babylonia, Assyria, Mitanni, Hittite, Syria, Canaanite, Elisha, and Cyprus. So basically all of the tribes, <laughs> you know, mentioned in the Bible. And finally, Ra. And the god Ra. Ra, which is in one of his many forms, Ra has the head of the falcon of the sun disk of Wajet resting on his head. Ra, pronounced as Ra and sometimes as Ray, is an Egyptian sun god. By the 5th dynasty, he became a major deity in the Egyptian religion, identified primarily with the midday sun, 
with other deities representing other positions of the sun. Ra changed greatly over time, and in one form or another, much later, he was said to represent the sun at all times of the day. And, you know, this is where you get, you know, the sun worship and all of that, right? Ra kind of being, you know, a culmination of all of them. You know, Ra, um, the chief cult center of Ra first was based in Heliopolis, right? The pillars, the Jed. Uh, meaning the city of the sun. In later Egyptian dynastic times, it merged with the god Horus, Ra Horkadi. Uh, many variant spellings. When his worship reached his position of importance in the Egyptian pantheon, it was believed to command the sky, the earth, and the underworld. He was associated with the falcon, the symbol of other sun deities, who protected the pharaohs in later myths. The deities were paired with pharaohs, the children of Hathor, were considered to be fathered by Ra, and the children of Hathor could also be the sons of Satan, Ra being Saturn, or the Saturn son, right? Although not the contemporary view, E.A. Wallace Bulge claims that Ra was the one god of Egyptian monotheism, of which all other deities were aspects, manifestations, phases, or forms. Uh, Ra should be pronounced as Re, Hence the alternative spelling, Re, rather than Ra. The meaning of Ra's name is uncertain, but it's thought as if not a word for sun, it may be a variant or link to creative. As his cult rose in the Egyptian pantheon, Ra often replaced Atum as the father, grandfather, great-grandfather of the deities of the Ennead and became creator of the world. Up until the mid-20th century, theories of Egyptologists postulated that Heliopolis priesthood established the uh, Pesajet at Heliopolis in order to place their local sun god Ra above all other deities, such as Osiris. Many Egyptologists now question this. Um, it appears almost certain, though, rather than the great Ennead, that nine deities of Atom, nine planets, right? Seven planets, sun, and a moon, or nine planets, nine deities of Atom, Geb, Isis, Newt, Osiris, Neptis, Set, Shu, and Tefnut first appeared during the decline of Ra's cult in the 6th dynasty. And remember, six, the 6th six god, Saturn as well, the 6th dynasty. Very crazy. And after that introduction of the new pest jet of the cult of Ra, soon saw a great resurgence until the worship of Horus gained prominence. Afterward, worship focused on the synchristic solar deity Ra Horkadi, Ra, which is Horus of the Two Horizons, during the Armana period of the 18th dynasty, Akhenaten introduced worship of another solar deity, Aten. The deified solar disk represents his uh, preferred regional deity as he attempted to lesser the influence of the Temple of Atum. He built the wet just Atum, elevating the sun disk a temple in Anu. Blocks from his temple later were used to build walls to the medi medieval city of Cairo and included some of the city gates. The cult of Menevis bull, the embodiment of Ra, had its enter here, established a formal burial ground for the sacrificed bulls north of the city. And later, Miss Ra was seen to have been, uh, have created Sekhmet, the early lioness war goddess who became Hathor, right, and the lion, um, or lion-headed serpent, right, with Yal de Bayoff, or uh, lion of the tribe of Judah, right, uh, the war goddess Hathor, the cow goddess, after she sufficiently punished mankind as an avenging eye of Ra. And we've talked about the eye symbolism all the way through this. This changes the themes of much earlier myths into aspects of his and he is often said to be the father of both. Uh, the brother to the god Osiris. And Osiris' is death. Afterwards, nearly all forms of life supposedly were created only by Ra who could call each of them into existence by speaking their secret names, and eventually humans were created from Ra's tears and sweat. Hence the Egyptians called themselves the cattle of Ra, right? And the tears and sweat coming from the water, right? Which would be the semen, the sea foam, right? Part of reproduction, right? From the gods. Uh, symbolism. Ra shared many of his symbols with other solar deities. In particular, Horus usually depicted as a falcon. In artwork, Ra primarily is depicted as a man wearing a pharaoh's crown, a sign of his leadership of the deities, and the Wadjet sun disk above his head. Often he had a falcon's head, as does Horus, and in later myths about Ra, the sun is portrayed differently, according to the position of the sun in the sky. This was an early theme in Egyptian myths, which different names assigned to the sun depending on its position in the sky. At sunrise, he was a young boy, Kepri, at noon, the falcon-headed man Herkati, and at the sunset, the elder Atum. 
Uh, the constant aging was suggested by some later Egyptians as the reason Ra stayed separate from the world and let Osiris and Horus rule in his place. He was a trinity. Uh, the idea is often coupled with the myth in which Isis is able to trick an elderly Ra, having ruled an earth as a human pharaoh, into revealing his secret name and thus the secret of his power. Ra, subse Ra su subsequently lost his power, resulting in the cult of Isis and Osiris to rise in importance. Um, the Bennu bird, asteroid Bennu, the phoenix, is Ra's Ba and a symbol of fire and rebirth. The Wajet sun disk, also shown as a hieroglyphic Ankh, symbolizes that life is given by the sun. And the obelisk represents the rays of the sun and was worshipped as a home of the solar god. Pyramids aligned to the east and west. The falcon, bull, and cobra commonly seen wrapped around the sun disk. The form of the goddess Wajet, who often was depicted as an Egyptian cobra, an animal thought only to be female, and reproducing through parthenogenesis, which is, you know, only insects and serpents are able to do, um, or in parasites. Some traditions relate that the first Wajet was created by the goddess Isis, who formed it with the dust of the earth and the spittle of autumn. Sound familiar? Man being formed from the dust of the earth, the serpent being cursed to eat the dust, right? To eat man, right? The spirit devouring um, the lower carnal aspect, right? Transfiguration, or the Vesica Pisces, the Ouroboros, the serpent devouring its own tail. The Eurasis was the instrument with which Isis gained the throne of Egypt from her husband Osiris, as the son Ra was thought to see everything. Uh, together with Atum, Ra was believed to have fathered Shu and Tefna, who in turn bore Geb and Lut. These in turn were the parents of Osiris, Isis, Set, also known as Seth and Nephthys. All nine made up the Heliopolitan Ennead. And in mythology, for the Egyptians, the sun represented light, warmth, and growth. This made sun deities very important to the Egyptians, and it is no coincidence that the sun came to be the ruler of all. In his myth, the sun was either seen as the holy or, or as the body or eye of Ra. Journey of Ra traveling through the underworld, and we've seen this depiction many times and in many variations right here, in his solar bark. A journey he undertakes every night. Right? The journey of the sun. To the serpent below. The primordial serpent and sun boat. Uh, Ra was thought to travel in a sun boat. The boat of the millions. To protect its fires from the primordial waters of the underworld. It passed through during the night. Ra traveled in the sun boat with various other deities including Set and Mahan, who defended against the monsters of the underworld, and Mayot, who guided the boat's course. The monsters included Apep, or Epepi, or Apophis, the god of chaos and darkness, um, you know, a dragon or fabulous kind of serpent, an enormous serpent who tried to stop the sun's boat journeys every night by consuming it. Um, the raw mist saw the sunrise as a rebirth of the sun goddess Nut, by the goddess Nu and the sky, thus attributing to the concept of rebirth and renewal to Ra and strengthening his role as creator God. And in the pyramid text, uh, Ra is perpetually resurrected in the morning in the form of a scarab beetle. Kepri, which means the emerging one, he rides on the primordial waters, walking on water, called noon, right? Noon, 12, right? High noon. Um, in his sacred bark or boat, right, or ship, or planet, or vessel, along with the number of other deities across the sky, where at sunset he becomes Atom, or Atom, right, fall, the All-Lord, or All-Father. At sunset he's swallowed by the goddess Nut, Night, Nox, or Pan, who gives birth to him each morning, again as Capri, therefore the cycle continues with birth, life and death, and we see this play out in so many different schools of thought, especially when it comes to the mysteries, um, you know, in spirituality, just esoterics, you know, the Dogon, right, uh, uh, the Doge, or, you know, being uh, the, the water or the night, on, like the light switch flipping on for the sun, or the positive, right, positive and negative, um, 
early in the myths, Ra was said to be married to Hathor, and they were uh, the parents of Horus. Later in the myths, he changed Hathor to Ra's daughter. The feature prominently in the myth often called the story of Sekhmet, in which Ra sent Hathor down to punish humanity as Sekhmet. Right? Ra had four children, Newt, Sky, Shu, Tefnut, and Geb, Earth. Newt and Geb created four children, Set, Osiris, Isis, Neptus, Osiris, and Iris created Horus. Um, Amun-Ra, which it says that most widely worship Egyptian deity, Ra's identity was confused with others. Amun-Ra uh, was a member of the Ogdo, right? Ogdo, Dogon, right? And creation energies with Amunet, or a very early patron of Thebes, he was believed to create via breath, the breath of life, the breath of God, and thus was identified with the wind rather than the sun. Uh, the cult of Amun and Ra became increasingly popular in Upper and Lower Egypt. Respectively, they were combined to create Amun-Ra, the solar creator god. The name Amun-Ra is reconstructed. It's hard to distinguish exactly when this combination happened, but references to Amun-Ra appeared in Pyramid Texts as early as the 5th Dynasty. The most common belief is that Amun-Ra invented a new state deity by the Theban rulers of the New Kingdom to unite worshippers of what Amun with the older cult of Ra around the 18th dynasty. Atum-Ra, or Ra-Atum, was uh, another composite deity formed from two completely separate deities. However, Ra shared more similarities with Atum than he did with Amun. Atum was closely linked with the sun and was also a creator god of the Ennead. Both Ra and Atum were regarded as the father of the deities and pharaohs and were widely worshipped. In older myths, Atum was the creator of Tefna and Shu and he was born from the ocean Noon. And uh, Ra Herkati um, and Herakti. And think about, you know, Heracles, Hermes, right? Uh, hermetically sealed. In later Egyptian mythology, Ra Harakti was more of a title or manifestation than a composite deity. It's Ra who is Horus of the Horizons and was intended to link Harakti, a sunrise oriented aspect of Ra to, to Ra or Horus to Ra, which suggested Ra Harakti simply refers to the sun's journey from horizon to horizon. And that was meant to show Ra as a symbolic deity of hope and rebirth. Excuse me. You see the trident on his head there, you know, Poseidon. Um, Kepri and Kunum. Kepri was a scarab beetle who rode up the sun in the morning and was sometimes seen as a morning manifestation of Ra. Similarly, the ram-headed god, Kunum, was also seen as the evening manifestation of Ra. The idea of different deities or different aspects ruling over different times of the day was fairly common but variable. With Kepri and Kanum taking precedence over sunrise and sunset, Ra was often the representation of midday. Uh, when the sun reaches peak at noon, sometimes different aspects of Horus were used instead of Ra's aspects. In Thelina's Liber Resh Vel Helios, Ra represents the rising sun with Hathor as the midday sun and Tum as the setting sun. And just kind of think morning star, evening star, right, with Lucifer as well. Um, Ra rarely was combined with Ptah. The sun crosses over Ptah in the underworld before Ptah is reborn. Uh, thus, there would be no sun ray. When this happens, other combinations can do and exist. The rising sun with the sun ray, the moon sun with the sun ray, and the sitting with the sun ray. But as a Memphite creation myth, he was often said to be Ptah's first creation, through his divine will, especially when associated with Atum or Amun. And worship, his local cult began from roughly the second dynasty establishing Ra as a sun deity. By the fourth, the pharaohs were seen to be Ra's manifestation on earth, referred to as sons of Ra. His worship impressed, um, increased massively in the fifth dynasty. He became a state deity and pharaohs had uh, specially aligned pyramids, obelisks, and solar temples built in his honor. The first pyramid text began to arise, giving Ra more and more significance in the journey of the pharaoh through the underworld. The Middle Kingdom saw Ra increasingly combined and affiliated with other deities, especially Amun and Osiris. The Middle Kingdom saw Ra increasingly combined with affiliated with other deities, especially Amun and Osiris. And during the New Kingdom, the worship of Ra 
became more complicated and grand. The walls of tombs were dedicated to extremely detailed texts that told of Ra's journey through the underworld. He was said to carry the prayers and blessings of the living souls of the dead in the sunboat. The idea that Ra aged with the sun and became more popular with the rise of the new kingdom eventually during the reign of Akhenaten, the worship reached the level of uncompromising monotheism. Many acts of worship included hymns, prayers, and spells to help Ra and the sun boat overcome Apep. Through worship of Ra was widespread, his cult center was in Heliopolis in Lower Egypt. Oddly enough, this was the home of the Ennead, which was believed to be headed by Atum, with whom he was merged. The holiday of receiving of Ra was celebrated on May the 26th in the Gregorian calendar. Though Ra lived in various forms in the Greco-Roman period, his worship gradually deteriorated during the first millennium. The decline was probably due to the weakening of the kingship under various foreign rulers. Though he continued to be a part of Egyptian theology, he was no longer part of the people's living faith. Devotion to Ra became more and more limited to priest of the temple. The rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire caused an end to the worship of Ra by the citizens of Egypt and Ra. Uh, popularity suddenly died out. The study of Ra became purely for academic knowledge, even among the Egyptian priests. And, you know, um, you know, this is going to take us to the Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, the OTO, Hermeticism, right, and the mysteries, and all of these, how they spin off of this sealed or hidden occulted knowledge from the gods of Egypt. So uh, next week, that's what we're going to get into. We're going to, you know, take this and go to the complete system uh, of the Golden Dawn, the magic of the Golden Dawn, which is the Hermetic Society, who whose members are taught the principles of occult science and the magic of Hermes during the early part of the second half of the last century. Several eminent adepti and chiefs of the order in France and England died and their death caused temporary dormant conditions of temple work. Prominent among the adepti of our order of the public renown were Eliphas Levi, the greatest of modern French magi, Ray John, the author of several books of occult lore, Kenneth M. McKenzie, the author of the famous and learned Masonic Encyclopedia, Frederick Hockley, possessed the power of vision in the crystal and whose manuscripts are highly esteemed, these and other contemporary adepti of the order received their knowledge and power from predecessors of equal and even greater eminence. They received indeed and have handed down to us their doctrine and system of theosophy and hermetic science and the higher alchemy, alchemy from a long series of practiced investigators whose origin is traced to the Freiters Rosicrucis of Germany with the association founded by one Christian Rosenkreutz about the year 1398 A.D. The Rosicrucian revival of mysticism was but a new development of the vaster, older wisdom of Kabbalistic rabbis and of that very ancient secret knowledge, the magic of the Egyptians, in which the Hebrew Pentateuch tells you that Moses, the founder of the Jewish system, was learned and that he, that is, in which he had been initiated. Right, so we're going to look at the Golden Dawn. We are going to look at the OTO. And this is the study guide from the degree from Minerva to the seventh degree with bulimic session, right? OTO, under the seal of the obligation of nothing in particular. And very interesting too. We're going to get into the OTO study guide here with the Golden Dawn. Um, you know, we're going to look at a uh, Library of Egyptian Secrets as well as Rosicrucianism as well, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and the Rose Bloodline, the Flower of Life, the Rosicrucians, the Order of the Rose and Cross. May the roses bloom upon your cross. We're going to get into all of this, the occult, the mysteries, the mystery schools next week as uh, just building upon these deep dives these journeys that we've been looking at. So I hope you guys enjoyed the Egyptian gods, breaking down the Egyptian gods, Akhenaten, Ra, Osiris, Isis, um, you know, and uh, it's kind of seeing where, you know, the Jejed and a lot of where these mysteries of the occult come from, where these esoteric teachings come from. We're going to, you know, go way deeper next week. So make sure you hit the like, give us a thumbs up, 
Leave a comment, 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 comment. Let me know what you think. Share the link so other people can see it. And uh, remember, reviewer powered. So please, if you enjoyed this, donate, support, uh, show some love to the channel. Help me keep it going. I need y'all's help. Um, and subscribe. Make sure you're subbed as well. Uh, yeah, and book your own personal tarot reading. They're great gifts for Christmas, birthdays, for you or someone else. You know, they're pretty cheap and inexpensive too. Great ways to like look into uh, the energies. Check out our tarot videos, our astrology videos. Check out the video we did last week. We got so much cool stuff coming. So much cool stuff out right now. I'm really excited. I'm really pumped. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, make sure to hit the like. Subscribe, share it. Donate support. Uh, book your reading. 513-393-2396 or email the real best damn podcast at gmail.com. I love you guys and I will see you next time. Remember, Jesus is the truth, way, and life. God bless you all. Peace.